Hi everyone, so this is the second video on heat um, and heat calculations and remember in the previous video we ended with the concept of specific heat and molar heat capacity as well as uh, heat capacity itself. So if you remember back to the slide where I talked about heat capacity, we say that heat capacity is just a, a proportionality constant between heat and temperature change. And so uh, we can write this equation then, which is that Q is equal to C times delta T, where C is your heat capacity. Now, um, now that we come up with this two new um, intensive property version of heat capacity, we can rewrite that equation again, uh, Q equals C delta T. But if we want to express this equation in terms of specific heat capacity, which is C sub S, then what we need to do, of course, is just multiply the mass into the specific heat to get our heat capacity back and then multiply that by delta T. So then the equation, if you use specific heat, becomes M C sub S times delta T. If you use the molar heat capacity, then it becomes N, which is the number of moles, times C sub M times delta T. Okay, so understand that these three uh, equations are all really the same. They all calculate heat, but you just use uh, whichever equation depends on the context of the problem, as I said in the previous slide. So if, you know, if you're given something that just has uh, heat capacity, then you would just use this equation. And, and uh, you know, if you're given specific heat, which is the most common type of information you'll be given, you'd be using this equation. So a lot of you might be familiar with this MC delta T equation. A lot of people would shorten it as uh, MCAT just to remember it. Uh, but, you know, the, this is just one version of the equation. There are other versions of the same equation that will allow you to calculate heat. Okay, so let's work through this example really quickly. If you read this example, it says the heat capacity of 18 grams of ice is 37.7 joules per Kelvin. Uh, calculate the final temperature of 18 grams of ice initially at minus 20 degrees uh, when 200 joules of heat are absorbed by the ice at constant temperature. Okay, so you have this ice, it's 18 grams. Uh, you heat it up with uh, 200 joules of energy uh, and it goes in as heat and you want to know what is the final temperature. Well, if you look at this uh, problem, the information that's given to you is heat capacity. So then if you go back, you think about which equation would be appropriate because you're given heat capacity, the information that's appropriate therefore to, the equation that's appropriate to use therefore is C times delta T. And you might wonder, well, isn't mass given here and wouldn't, wouldn't that affect the calculation, 18 grams versus 1 gram? But you notice that the heat capacity is given as heat capacity. It's not given as specific heat. So it's not given as joules per gram degree Celsius. So the mass here doesn't need to be multiplied with this number. If you multiply it, in fact, you, you're not going to get a, a meaningful uh, unit out of it. Okay, so that's one of the things to realize when you're reading a problem is to kind of understand you know, is that mass needed to be, you know, do I need to use that mass in the calculation? Uh, and in this case, you don't, okay? Okay, so here I'm rewriting a couple of pieces of information from the problem. So remember that we're given uh, the heat capacity itself, which is 37.7 uh, joules per Kelvin, and then we're given initial temperature, which is at um, negative 20 degrees Celsius, and we, we were told that 200 joules of heat is... Uh, given so heat of course is Q so in other words you have 200 of 200 joules of Q being uh, delivered to the ice okay now the equation of interest in, in this case like I said earlier was just C times delta T because your um, in the heat capacity version that's given is just the heat capacity not the specific heat or the molar heat capacity so easily I can just solve for um, delta T which just will be 200 joules over 37.7 joules per Kelvin. You notice that the units cancel out nicely, the joules cancel, leaving you with an answer just in Kelvin. And um, that answer is 5.5.3 uh, Kelvin, okay? And then, of course, 
what you need to do is then calculate uh, the final temperature. Now remember that delta T is always equal to T final minus T initial and that's equal to 5.3 Kelvin. So then T final therefore is 5.3 Kelvin plus T initial. Remember T initial is minus 20 degrees Celsius. Now you have two different units here but remember that Kelvin increase. So if you're increasing 5.3 degrees Kelvin you're going to um, increase by the same temperature in Celsius, right? So in other words, we can also write this as 5.3 degrees Celsius uh, plus negative 20 degrees Celsius. And if you do that, your answer would be negative 14.7 degrees Celsius, okay? Now again, if uh, some of you are confused by the idea that the Kelvin and the Celsius temperature is, is the same, we're not saying the actual temperature is the same. I'm not saying that the uh, negative 20 Celsius is equal to negative 20 Kelvin. That would be different, but what I'm saying is the increase. So remember that 5.3 corresponds to the delta T component, right? So the delta T in Celsius and the delta T in Kelvin would be exactly the same because an increase in one degree Celsius is, is the same as an increase in one degree Kelvin, okay? Okay, so here I just want to highlight a few, uh, you know, several different uh, values of heat capacity, uh, specific heat capacity in this case. So if you look at these numbers here, um, you can see that these are uh, mostly for the elements and you can see that they're all metals. They all have fairly low heat capacity, specific heat in this case. So remember what that implies. That implies that it takes very little energy, very little heat, in order to increase the temperature of these metals by one degree Celsius. And if you think about this from your own experience, this makes sense, right? Because if you have a piece of metal and you have something hot near it, the metal gets hot very quickly, okay? Its temperature goes up very quickly because it doesn't take a lot of, a lot of heat in order to increase the temperature of uh, a piece of metal, like any, any of these metals right here. You can see that lead and gold have very little uh, heat needed to increase the temperature. Aluminum takes a lot more, but still it's uh, fairly low. Now, compare this to things like uh, ethanol and water, for example, water specifically. It takes about four joules of energy to increase uh, the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Uh, of course, you know, and, and if you look at something like gold, it takes only 0.1, so there's about a, a, a factor of uh, four uh, in, you know, 40 to uh, increase the temperature of water by one degree Celsius, one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So it takes about 40 times more energy to increase the temperature of water, okay? Um, and this really explains why water is such a, go to this animation, uh, this uh, map a little bit, really explain why water is such a good uh, insulator of heat, okay? So this explains uh, weather and fluctuation and temperature that you see throughout the different parts of Los Angeles, for example. Uh, where we are in Santa Monica, we're fairly close to um, the water, right? A huge body of water, Pacific Ocean. So if you look at the temperature of, of uh, you know, day and nighttime temperature around Santa Monica, you see that the temperature fluctuates between 61 degrees to 54 degrees, let's say, uh, uh, 61 to 55. So there about fluctuation about 6 degrees Fahrenheit in this case. Now, if you go to something like Riverside, which is located here, where there's not a lot of water, you can see that the uh, fluctuation of temperature is a lot more severe. So you go, uh, you know, about 25 degree uh, Celsius difference from day to night. Uh, and again, in Santa Monica, it's only about six. So you can ask the question, why is that? And the fact that you have a lot of water helps to guard against huge temperature changes because it takes a lot of uh, energy in order to increase the temperature of the water. So as a result, a lot of the water is just absorbing all that energy and uh, making the temperature fluctuation not as much. And similarly, at nighttime, the water is, you know, it's, it's uh, on the other side releasing the energy. Uh, and, it, you know, again, it takes uh, a lot of energy to lower the temperature of water, uh, the, you know, a, a good chunk of energy to release the temperature of water. So as a result, uh, the fluctuation at nighttime also is not so severe. You compare it to Riverside where there's not a lot of water, but of course what we have a lot around the area is uh, sand because it's sort of a desert area. So if you look back at that table with the um, heat capacity of sand, specific heat capacity of sand, you see that it's about 0.8. So that again compared to water would be about, you know, uh, five times uh, less 
energy it takes to heat the temperature of sand right by one degree Celsius so as a result uh, things get hot more quickly when you have a lot of sand nearby and things got cool also more quickly when you have a lot of sand nearby because it just you know it just doesn't absorb as as well as water would okay and doesn't release as, as well as water would so that's really a, an important idea in, in understanding specific capacity um, and you know how that affects you know building materials and, and where you live and so on